Amazing. Um, at this point, every, everybody agrees that the 10,000 wins makes everybody look bad, but I promise you that-, that Sorry about that. <laughs> the, uh, at least the pictures I'm gonna show are going, are going to be very flat to your eyes, because without modesty, I can say that these are the prettiest insects among us, the prettiest insects that have come to exist. In this group, I, I'm not sure if you have heard of them, they're tree hoppers. Uh, they have an outstanding morphological diversity, and it's unique in the fact that it, it is centered on a single thoracic structure that we call the pronotum. This is the dorsal portion of the first thoracic segment. And as you can see, it takes on a huge, a wide array of forms that can um, mimic ants and um, can resemble that twigs and etc. And we know so little about um, the function that they have um, in tree hopper diversification and survival, but we think that they play a central role um, in, in, in many, in many uh, biological aspects. Um, within this microcosms of, uh, microcosm of diversity, I am very interested in studying uh, the taxonomy, systematics, and uh, evolution of the genus Heteronotus because they show an outstanding, um, really an outstanding appearance. <coughs> These are a relatively small group of tree hoppers with 30 uh, currently circumscribed species, and they're exclusive, exclusively neotropical. So based on a variety of data, there are several lines of evidence, we have hypothesized that there are at least three pronotal adaptive strategy uh, in heteronotus. The first of which is wasp mimicry. Um, and <laughs> this is ridiculous. Like, why are you wearing dresses like that? Uh, why are you dressed like that? Uh, the second of which is ant mimicry. As you can see in the wasp mimicries, this is the male. This is the male, and this is the female. They are not um, very sexually dimorphic, except that the females in tree hoppers are usually bigger. Um, but in the ant mimics, what you can see is a real extreme uh, sexual dimorphism. And these are, these are, this is how they structure to look in the lateral profile and in the dorsal profile. Um, but we are not gonna address them today, maybe in the future when we figure out how to address the morphometrics of this highly uh, diverging structure, right? Right? Um, oh, another thing, another interesting thing is that the ant mimics, they are mutualistic associated with ants, who do not seem to be the models except in this one recorded case in the Brazilian Atlantic, Atlantic forest. Um, here you can see the male, pretended by the ant. Um, I'm not gonna digress, we have no time for that. But reconstructing the, the, reconstructing the phylogeny of heteronotus and plotting these adaptive strategies, the putative adaptive strategy in the phylogeny, we, we see how interesting is, is the fact that the wasp mimics are closely related to each other, and then in the second, in the second clip, we have um, ant mimics and camouflage. And today, I'm going to talk to you about probably the most interesting group, which is this uh, early uh, diverging lineage. Lineage that it's not wasp mimicking, not ant mimics, but cryptic. Um, and the interesting, uh, the, another interesting thing is that uh, these these guys include um, our taxonomically circumscribed to a single species. But they have um, so many uh, morphological syndromes and the males are different than, than the females. Uh, unfortunately, we have no ecological data. These guys uh, look like they are uh, canopy dwellers. They occur throughout the Brazilian Amazon. And unlike many other tree hopping groups, we have no other um, uh, very uh, strong characters to support or to infer species limits. So the first thing that we did was a species limitation. Some of our questions are how many spe species level lineages are in the heteronotus uh, delineators group? How sexually dimorphic are they? Uh, what geometric morphometric can tell us about uh, their, the history of this diversification and the magnitude of their pro pronotal variation? And how are they uh, distributed? So for that, we assembled a data set with three, six genes uh, for 68 samples, including the, uh, the majority of these morphotypes. 
We have done initially um, a phylogenetic reconstruction using beast. Uh, in, the first, in, in this first part of the study, we used uh, two different species limitation methods to infer uh, their diversity, right? Their, their species diversity. Uh, I'm not sure how familiar you are with uh, species delimitation methods, but this is a single locus approach, and this is a multi-locus approach, the B BGMIC and BTMP. Uh, for the BGMP <coughs> analysis, we need to previously assign the individuals to, uh, to punitive species, and um, we also need a, a fully resolved tree. So to test, um, to to um, see how many different species limitation schemes we would get, we have run BPMP analysis using different combination of Tika and top tau tires. Um, for this, for the prior delimitation of populations, we have used the information in the tree, and we also uh, have ordered all these multiple track types by locality and by sex. And anyway, we got 27 putative species. But as a result, here's our tree. It's fairly well supported. The major nodes um, have um, higher than 90% uh, posterior probability. And these are the results in the limitation schemes, um, which are largely uh, congruent. Um, uh, we have observed that uh, the distribution, the, the, the priors have affected, <coughs> they, they can, they can give you uh, the schemes that are more or less conservative. Um, some points of discordance here uh, show this, uh, this BGMIC analysis have uh, given us these species with multiple males and female forms as opposed to over delimited males and females <coughs> that are identical and occur in the same area uh, delimited as uh, different species. So when we look at the most congruent species delimitation schemes, we can um, see that some of them occur in the same areas as, as in the example of the A, the a D, I, and G, and B, and F, and D, and E. Um, but here's the, here, here comes the interesting part. What, how are these shapes evolving? Uh, so we have acquired uh, 11 landmarks. And initially, we only did this for the, for the uh, specimens in our phylogeny, which is a very limited sampling. So this is the very first, first pass of our analysis, but I just want to show you which is the direction that we're taking and the, what, what is the potential that tree hoppers have um, as a, a, a great model to understand uh, diversification of these interesting morphologies. So here, what you can see is a phylogeny space of um, the, the tree with the species delimitation scheme plotted as colors and males and females. And this picture tells us a lot about, in, a lot of interesting things about the morphological diversification in this group. Um, the first thing that I want to point out is that the males, they <coughs> explore a slightly different region of the morphospace than the females. The females explore, a, how can I say, like a wider uh, um, axis of the PC1, and the males, uh, the variation is like within this array here, but they can be very well differentiated by the their PC2. Uh, another interesting thing is the disparity of the sexes. The females and males are like really, really sexually dimorphic. It's crazy to think that within this one species you have up to 13 species, all of which what, when we have the representation of the two sexes, they are sexually dimorphic. So it's really interesting to see how in this very early diverging lineages, you have so much more, much, so much morphological variation. And here you can see how, it had, had, how heterogeneous it can be, but at, at the same point, we also identify a case of convergence here in which the males of the B species, they look very much alike the females of another species. Um, and a spoiler, they are not symmetric. They occur in totally different locations. So this is an outstanding case of convergence in very, very uh, early diverging um, uh, species. So here are the areas of symmetry plotted in the morphological space with the species limitation. 
And, and here you can see that these species here, they occur sympatrically. These species occur sympatrically. And these species occur sympatrically. And if you're, oh, yeah. And if you look at how these guys look, if you're curious at all, this is how they look like. Uh, this is the phalomorphous space only with females, and the phalomorphous space only with the males, showing that there is a great potential for us to further describe those species based on morphometrics, nucleotide data, and now we can go uh, look for some discrete uh, 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 characters and look at the genitalia again with another point of view. Uh, so there. Uh, uh, I see a lot of potential for integrity taxonomy and also understanding the evolution of these complex states. And here are the newlyweds. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so um, the conclusions are a lot from um, the, the methods of the species of limitations to uh, uh, how we want to go with the morphology, but we want to keep going with the analysis. We want to explore uh, these uh, morphometrics using um, not 10,000, but a lot more than what I'm presenting today. Um, we want to see how, uh, if, there, if there is a potential for us to um, identify the species that were not included in the phylogeny only using morphometrics. We want to calculate rates of um, uh, morphological uh, <coughs> diversification and understand how quickly those those females and males are evolving, and so there is a lot of um, a lot of potential and a lot of a lot of future research that we want we want to do with this group. But I just wanted to put it out there how interesting this group is, and thank everybody um, for coming. Thank my funding agency for the generous support and also the generous.